So this session is about you know how you can build and operationalize end-to-end -end solutions using uh, Cortana Analytics. Uh, I will talk about Cortana Analytics and uh, what it is and you know its components, but we will primarily be focusing on the um, Azure ML, Azure Machine Learning, which is the machine learning engine of, of Cortana Analytics Suite. Um, so I just want to ask a couple questions before I start. You know, how many of you guys are data scientists? You do it every day, like your day job. Awesome. Uh, R users. Awesome. Python users. Okay, very good. So, uh, so if you're an R Python user, it means you're doing data science, probably, right? So, <laughs> um, so it's gonna, you know, uh, the. Uh, the way we want to present this uh, session is to sort of uh, have, uh, have you guys engage as much as possible with hands-on um, you know, exercises using the platform. So uh, if you are a newbie to the data science, you will um, you know, uh, get introduced to the Azure ML uh, platform, which is uh, a platform that is um, designed to make data science easy for people, for starters. You know, but also, it's, on the other hand, it has its uh, Python and, you know, um, our language extensibility, which makes it uh, appealing to uh, you know, experienced uh, data scientists as well. So depending on where you uh, stand in that spectrum of data science, I'm hoping that you guys will have uh, some sort of uh, uh, a take, take away from this session. But like I said, I want this to be hands-on and I, have, I want people to get engaged. So we're not going to do complicated data science here, because mainly because Microsoft Azure ML is, you know, is catered to make data science easy for people. So I'm going to walk you through some easy steps of doing data science uh, with uh, Azure ML and show you how you can use our scripts with Azure ML and also uh, Mushi will help you with, uh, with, with Python scripts and running them on Azure ML. And more importantly, we will be uh, operationalizing these solutions. Uh, uh, meaning we will make them web services uh, sitting on the cloud and then uh, as an application I'll show you an Excel sheet and uh, we'll use an add-in in the Excel sheet to make uh, calls, uh, request and response calls to, to our operationalized web services so that you can see how you can make online predictions using Azure ML as a cloud service. Okay, cool. Um, so I said Cortana Analytics Suite, Azure ML is a part of it. Uh, so uh, this suite is, is, a, is designed to you know, stitch uh, different technologies together to make these end-to-end -end pipeline, predictive pipelines possible. So we have a lot of um, you know, ingestion technologies like Azure Data Factory, Azure Event Hub, which uh, you know, Azure Data Factory orchestrates the movements of data in the cloud. Um, we have big data stores like uh, Azure Data Lake, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, where, where you can uh, collect, you know, um, store your data that you collected from uh, maybe um, your devices. Uh, and then we have analytics um, uh, components. Uh, the major one is Azure Machine Learning. Like I said, again, this, uh, the focus of the session is on Azure Machine Learning. You, you can uh, spin up Hadoop clusters, Spark clusters in, uh, in Azure. Uh, within the Cortana Suite Analytics, uh, we have Azure Stream Analytics. If you're having, if you have devices that are connected connected to the internet and are streaming data, you can use that service. And these, uh, they all come together in a nice way uh, that makes it easy for you to create these data data pipelines. And then, uh, you know, you can have your custom visualizations, dashboards. Uh, you can use Excel, like I said, or you can use any type of uh, application which you can make, uh, uh, you know which can make a good dashboard for you. Um, so once again, the session objectives and takeaways. Um, we will uh, quickly ingest a, a, data, a, da a data set, little data set, into Azure ML and create predictive models. Uh, we'll show how you can extend those with R and Python, and uh, that's, that is the focus of the session. We want you to understand how R and Python plays out with Azure ML. Um, and then we will operationalize the, uh, the models as web, web services. Um, so um, I want you to uh, go to this GitHub repository, https://github.com. F Boylan, my first name initial, and my last last name F B O Y L U. Um, slash Azure dash 
Machine Dash Learning Dash Lab. If you go there, um, I'll put it up again. Okay, so is there something wrong? Because I I don't want to drag it. Um, yeah, let's, let's mirror. Oh, awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. So this is the repository. Uh, these are the files that we've put up for you. Um, the lab one file zip is the part that I'm presenting, but it has a lot of files in it, like a large manual with a, you know Excel sheets for Power BI visualizations and things like that. So that, you know, that one file zip is pretty much for you to take home if you like and uh, have like a self-paced exercise later on on, on your own. Um, so I'll be using the churn data zip and the R scripts text and, uh, and then Mushi will be using the lab2 file zip. I think she's going to have them, have you guys download that zip file and use the contents. Um, like I said, this is a part of a, a larger manuscript of a lab. Uh, so I'm just, we're just giving you a taste of it. So if you want to go through a, a larger manual, you can uh, find it in the lab one files. If I'll, I'll keep them up for a while, but I'll probably uh, take, take it down after the uh, conference. So if you want to take advantage of the material, uh, download them as, as soon as possible. Um, so that is the GitHub. Um, and uh, so, so if I go back here. Uh, the next thing we need for this lab, uh, for the session, is an Azure ML, Azure Machine Learning uh, Workspace. Um, so for that, uh, you need to uh, go to um, studio.azureml.net. And once you go there, you need to sign in with a Microsoft account, meaning if, you know, outlook.com or if you have hotmail.com account, it has to be a Microsoft Live ID. This will give you free access to the uh, platform, okay, for you to play around with it. So, um, so please go ahead and try, go to that website as well, if you don't mind. So, since I'm already in there, uh, it'll take me to the home page, but it should uh, give you Did option. you do Windows P? It'll give you option to mirror it? You can just mirror that. Yeah, I'm doing that. But oh. Why do I have to do it every time? I have no idea. It should work fine. Okay. So, studio.azureml.net. So, again, I want this to be an interactive experience. If you don't do it, you'll, you'll get bored. <laughs> so, uh, make sure you go to these two websites, the GitHub and the uh, Azure, studio.azureml.net, and uh, sign in with your uh, live ID, you know, Hotmail account, or, you know, an Outlook account or so on. Okay, uh, if you don't have one, you can quickly set it up. It's easy. Um, so, any problems doing that, you know? You okay? All right. So, um, okay, once you do that, you're all set actually to perform the exercises. And I will um, go through the exercises uh, very quickly so that you have an idea of, uh, of the steps that we're going to take. Um, we're going to do a simple data upload to the platform, Azure ML. Um, this is a, a churn data set. I'll explain what it is and what it has later on. You'll need the data set. Um, we will create an experiment, simple experiment, and then, um, and then also uh, explore the data set a little bit and see what we can do uh, in terms of you know, very uh, preliminary um, um, you know, uh, data cleaning. After that, uh, second exercise will be a binary uh, classification model. Uh, we will um, we will train a binary classification using built-in um, modules in Azure Map, um, and these modules are actually work of uh, uh, long years of uh, you know research with Microsoft, and uh, finally you know last year. Uh, we decided to actually wrap these uh, machine learning models into modules and you know have a, have them uh, um, you know available to public and that's why Azure ML is uh, up there now. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of you know Microsoft uh, research behind all the uh, algorithms that reside in the in the tool. So uh, 
So that's what we're going to do as a second exercise. You will, we will train a test. We won't be doing, uh, you know, uh, parameter sweeping or you know, um, uh, cross validation things like that. Just for the uh, for the sake of keeping it simple, because uh, I know you guys already know what to do with your data. Um, and then uh, the next exercise is executing R scripts uh, and creating an R model inside Azure Mall. So I'll show you how to do that. And, uh, and then I will be creating web services both for the, uh, you know, um, um, the algorithms, um, the modules, um, the experiment binary classification experiment that is uh, uh, created by uh, internal modules, as well as the uh, uh, experiment that, uh, that uses uh, R scripts. I will operationalize both of them and then show you how to call them from Excel. And then uh, Musha will come up and she'll do a clustering exercise with uh, using the Python extensibility of the, of the tool. So uh, she'll take you through that uh, experience and then uh, she will also operationalize her model. And that is uh, pretty much it. The optional exercises are in, in the manual itself that I've said I've distributed through the zip file on the GitHub. Uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, you can do visualizations with Power View, or, you know, how you call uh, um, the web service from our studio, uh, parameter optimization, how you do how do you do that with Azure now and so on. So if you wanted to, like I said, do a self-paced exercise, these are some optional exercises in the lab manual. Um, so having said that, I'm gonna go uh, to my workspace here. Um, actually before that let's uh, go to GitHub and uh, if you can uh, download Two things, this churn data uh, Sorry. zip. Sorry, yeah. put you back on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, I'm not going to do any more PowerPoint, so <laughs> so, um, so please download churn data zip in our scripts and, you know, unzip them and, you know, have them readily available for yourself, okay? I already have those and I'm not going to spend time on that, okay? So, once you do that, um, if you are already signed in with your, you know, uh, live ID, you would you would hopefully have a, a workspace, a free workspace that would look like this. Uh, it should be in guest. the home screen. You can use guest. Uh, with guest, you have limited uh, <coughs> functionality. That's why I want I wanted people to uh, sign up. But if you just want to follow for the while, you know, do the exercises that guests will let you do, it's okay, it's okay now. But how, how many of you guys were able to have a workspace? Awesome, thank you, great. I'm happy to see that. Um, so, so if you're here in the home, studio, home page, uh, go to my experiments. And this is where you will come. This is the studio. And by the way, it's very user friendly. Uh, nothing complicated going on. It's lightweight. It's uh, it's powered by Azure. There's no installation required. Nothing whatsoever. You just upload your data sets and you know uh, create your experiments. It has a modular structure, which you will see in a minute. So let's let's start out with uh, uh, uploading our data set. Um, so for that, I'm hitting the, the plus new button here, and it gives you a lot of options here. Uh, you can actually start out with samples and go through all the samples and, you know, learn it by yourself as well. Um, and then this one will give you uh, the data set upload option, and you will upload it from a local file. So now here you go to your uh, unzip churn data uh, and find it. Uh, minus here. So double click and it's going to take it up. It'll say, oh, it's a CSV. Uh, and I'm going to name it actually as for my host speaker's request. <laughs> we will call this customer, uh, you don't have to name it, but uh, customer churn data. Okay? And uh, it's a generic CSV file. It has a header. I hit uh, OK and it's going to upload it with the green bars. Once it's done, uh, you'll see a check mark. 
while it does that, you can do other things. Um, so the next step for us is to actually create a, a, a new experiment. Uh, again, go to the new, and then uh, this time go to experiments tab, and then click on blank experiment. I'm not going to go through what's in there for the sake of time, but there are templates like text mining templates, like predictive maintenance templates, uh, you know, uh, fraud detection templates that you can actually import and you know start using right away uh, by customizing um, for your data. Uh, and uh, we make every effort to extend the library of uh, templates and you know uh, modules within Microsoft every day. So there's a huge effort uh, going on around uh, building this uh, tool uh, to, the, to the best standards, actually. Uh, so once you do uh, create an experiment, a data set is uploaded. Um, you have this blank canvas. And I want you to, again, notice how easy it is now. Because you're going to have a, you'll be just purely dragging items here from the left side to the right side and build your, to build your uh, workflow. Um, so you can name the experiment as churn pretty quickly and then uh, on the left sidebar here uh, I have all the modules that are available um, for uh, um, you know working with and uh, you can see there are Python language models, R language models, modules and you know statistical functions etc. But uh, we have a machine learning tab which we will get to. Uh, you can explore um, a lot of uh, good functionality is uh, already implemented in the tool. But again, with R and Python accessibility, the world is yours. You can throw in anything and uh, make this uh, uh, make this yours. So I will just uh, go ahead and, and under my data sets, I see the, the, the data set that I just uploaded, which is customer uh, churn data. I'm just going to pull it in. and. Uh, and then uh, let's do, uh, I think the next step is to sort of uh, do a, a, a select of uh, uh, columns. Uh, so here you, on the left sidebar, you know, you can go through the list yourself apparently, but you know, it gives you a search option which makes things a lot easy. So I will use the project columns uh, module. Uh, to actually show you uh, how you can exclude project columns uh, from your data set because I know by heart that there's a, an ex, uh, column that doesn't make sense uh, which we need to exclude and I will do that first but we will revisit this so once you pull in your project columns click, click on launch uh, column selector and you will see the list of columns actually here and um, we uh, actually, we should be beginning with all columns since I'm trying to exclude that column. I will make this exclude and I'll keep the column names as default and I'll pick X data observations. This is the index of the observations, that's why I'm taking it out, okay? So, uh, click um, the check mark and you'll have your uh, little first experiment here, okay? So what we do now is we run it and uh, and have it process it. I will then uh, right click, and we will check the uh, data set. Yeah. It's the first column x uh, x data observations. Here it is. Okay. So I will come back to this. So don't worry about it now. But it's the first uh, the column. So once you right click on the output. Uh, this is where I'm going to talk about the data set. Remember I said I'll talk about it later. Uh, you will be able to visualize your data set uh, for, for the first 100 columns here. Uh, rows, I apologize. And uh, what this data set, so uh, again, we call the churn, churn, customer churn data, right? So the idea of the whole drill is to sort of predict uh, customers who, will, who are likely to churn. So uh, churn, also called attrition rate, is the is the act of a customer leaving a service. So they don't, if you're a retailer, they don't come, they don't buy from your uh, shop anymore. If you're a telecom uh, service provider, they just switch to another telecom service provider. So that's what churn is, right? So
So this little data set is, uh, has about uh, 4,600 uh, individuals and their um, data um, around their data, cell phone usage actually, uh, which state they live and you know, if they have an international plan, if they have voicemail plans, uh, if they have day minutes, how many day minutes do they use, you know, how many day calls do they make, um, and so on. International calls, you know, email calls, email charges, etc. And then we have our label column, which is what uh, the column that we will use to make predictions on, as, and it's labeled as true. Um, so now I want you to actually uh, uh, notice here that I have uh, some statistics uh, showing us, uh, uh, you know, uh, some statistics of, of that column. You know, you can go from one column to the other to uh, observe those. And then we have uh, um, the uh, visualizations part where you can see an uh, histogram of uh, the, the frequency of calls and, you know, of your variables, etc. So if you pick international calls, I'm going to point out a uh, problem with this data set and, and uh, why. Um, why we include some, exclude some columns in the data set in the coming step. Uh, so if you highlight the international calls, and if you compare it to international charge, um, international minutes, I believe, sorry. International minutes to charge, right? Yes. What is this called, this phenomenon? Anybody? Any idea? So I've, I've actually scatter plotted one variable against the other, and I see this perfect line. Yes, they're perfectly correlated with each other, so it's the same information. Why? Because um, international limits, international charge is a, a constant uh, multiplied by the international minutes, minutes, the constant being the charge per, per, per minute, right? So unfortunately, in the data set, we have both the charges and the minutes. So for that reason, we don't want to overfit. We don't want to confuse the model. So we have to get rid of one of these uh, perfectly correlated uh, you know, variables, right? So we will do that in the next step. But any questions so far with the data set? Pretty clear, right? Sure data set, and, you know, don't use it yet. Could you go back a couple of steps and show again how uh, we're able to uh, select the model? Sure, definitely. So uh, let's select uh, international minutes, uh, night minutes. Which column? Which like column? Columns. Okay, right I have a question for the project columns, and then. Oh, I. See. So the you want this? Do you want? The, yeah. Okay. So in the project columns, you launch the column selector, and then I'm trying to exclude columns, right? So I begin with all columns. I then exclude the column names and I use the names of the columns and the drop down menu gives you to see the names of the columns. And while we're here, since you have seen the correlation between variables, let's go ahead and exclude these, uh, um, I think we exclude the uh, charges. So day charge I'm going to exclude, uh, evening charge I'm going to exclude, night charge I'm going to exclude, and uh, international charge I'm going to exclude because I know that information is already in the minutes. Alright, so another thing uh, is, you know, area code and phone, you know, uh, phone number definitely, it's uh, like a seven digit number that's, you know, unique for everybody, has no predictive power, probably. Area code may have some predictive power, but I'm going to, you know, choose to exclude that. I mean, you can always play around with these. So I'm going to exclude those two columns here as well. So now we have uh, X data observations, day charge, evening charge, night charge, um, and international charge, phone and area code excluded. Now I hit the check mark. Uh, this module will, will take care of that. I'm not going to run it again. But now I have, at least I know that I excluded some uh, correlated variables from my data set, right? Um, next step here is to go ahead and uh, split our data, right? 
like I said, I'm not going to do cross validation sweeping parameters, etc. But those are all available on, in here. Uh, we have a cross validation module. We have a, a sweep parameters module. You know, uh, and all sorts of advanced you know techniques that you can use uh, to do k-fold. You know. Um, Cross validation, etc. But for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to do a train and test split for the session. Uh, for that matter, I'm just going to uh, bring in a split model, split data module, and uh, I'm going to bring it in, drag and drop, and connect. And uh, you know, you can do 80 to 20, you know, 7 to 30. You usually do 7 to 30 for some reason, right? <laughs> But again, you know, you should be doing a careful cross validation for sure to, uh, you know, control or overfitting all the time and take uh, averages of, of your accuracy matrix to, uh, you know, because you're always uh, operating on a random sample for your train, and uh, that random sample is random; it can change and you know affect your um, variance. But uh, again, for the sake of simplicity, splitting to for 70% and 30%. Uh, for the test. Now we're going to train. Uh, so I'm going to train it. So I need a train, uh, train mod, uh, model uh, module. I will bring that in. And uh, I need to bring in uh, a learner actually, an algorithm. So for that, let's check out first what algorithms we have available um, on the machine learning. Remember, this is a, a classification task. A churn column is binary, two holes, a lean column. So, uh, and we're trying to predict that if somebody is a churn or not. So that, that means it's a binary classification model. So, uh, so to initialize our model, uh, you see um, Azure now has many different uh, algorithms. We have anomaly detection algorithms. We have classification, clustering, regression, and so on. So for classification, we have the multi-class and also uh, two-class classification algorithms. You can see for two-class, um, we have uh, you know decision forest, decision jungles, etc. So I'm just going to pull in the boosted uh, decision tree module here. Yes, question. Go ahead, please. Uh, can you run any competition between these models? Is of course, possible? of course, definitely. That's the whole idea. <laughs> so you can always. Uh, uh, create a, a branch next to your uh, main branch and then run that as well and then uh, using an evaluate model module you can compare the results. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to compare the training results with the test results so that you can see how you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of your predictions. So, uh, so for that uh, I'm actually now I'm trying to, I will be uh, letting my train model module uh, know that I'm going to use a two-class boosted decision tree and on the 70% of the data set. And then I'm going to also, uh, right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this cool feature. I'm actually uh, doing a control C for copy of that module that I highlighted, which is train, and then control V to paste it back. And I'm just going to bring it here and uh, uh, sorry about that, I don't need the train module, I need the score module, apologies. So next thing I need is the score module, but you've seen how to copy paste in the meantime. I will bring the score model and I will uh, connect my train model to the left side of my score model and then I will connect the, uh, the training data to the right side. Meaning I want the score to give me the uh, training scores. Now I'm going to do a, a copy paste of the score model and let me zoom out here for you a little bit. Too, too uh, small. Probably. And then this time I want my train this score to actually score the test, test data set using the model that's trained. Okay? And then as a last step, we do an evaluate evaluation module. Evaluate model module. 
to compare between the training and test results. Uh, performance, actually, not the results. Uh, so there's something wrong here. I have a value required warning. I actually won't run before I uh, provide this value here. So everybody with me so far? Any problems? So we prove in the true class posted decision trees, a train model module, two score models. We connected the 70% split uh, for the training and 30% for the for scoring the test set. Any questions? So far so good or? All right, cool. So this is where I need to let the model know which column I'm gonna train on, the target label column, right? So, and that column is? Sure, sure right, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so once I do that, I can hit run and have the model uh, learn. So it may take a little bit, we'll see. Uh, here you can see that, you know, uh, if you go to the learner, to class to decision trees, it has all these parameters that you can play around with, okay? We have a sweep model module, uh, sweep parameters module, which will actually do the sweep for you uh, in a grid of uh, parameter values, okay? We have that available as well. So if I were doing a grid search, where would I put this in my, um, where would I put this in these like, branches? Right, if you're be, doing a grid search, you would just... Uh, it would be prior to training model. You will take the train model, delete it, and replace it with a sweep, sweep uh, uh, parameter module. Okay. okay? Cool. So, so we have that. So it was nice and easy. It ran pretty quickly. So let's check out the uh, uh, the results, uh, the performance matrix. And if you right click on the evaluate model module and visualize, it will show you a nice uh, ROC curve um, for both uh, the score data set and the score data set to compare, in which case the, the trained uh, uh, data set is the, the blue one, and the test uh, results are the uh, red one, right? So you can see uh, what, a lot of overfitting going on in the training, and uh, if you go down, you see the, uh, the uh, confusion matrix here, with uh, the number of uh, true positives and false positives, and, uh, negatives and true negatives, and then we have a threshold mechanism um, as you slide through here, you pretty much you can observe how your accuracies and precisions change. Um, so this was the uh, training data set, right? So in the test set, apparently, we have uh, all these uh, mistakes. Uh, predictions, bad predictions that we're making. We have 17 false positives and 43 false negatives. Um, our AUC is around 0.923, right? So now the best part is, uh, let's say I decided on this, uh, you know, a model. It's a good model. I'm going to make use of it in my pipeline and my, you know, dashboard. How can I do that, right? That's uh, this is where the you know, beauty of Azure Mail lies, actually, because with, with a couple of clicks, we will be um, publishing this as a web service on the internet, okay? Uh, so for, that's easy to do, and it, it's going to guide you through this, uh, through the process. What, I, what you just need to do is you just click on the Set, set Up Web Service button here, hover on it, and it's going to give you two options, and uh, one is predict the web service, and the other one is retaining web service, uh, retraining web service, that's also an available thing so that you can retrain your models again and again and republish on, on the other, uh, on top of the older ones. Uh, if you click on the predictive web service, it's going to do something. You can clearly do it yourself once you understand what's going on. But what it did was actually it saved our model as a, as a model, a train model, and it created a predictive experiment, and it added these web service inputs and outputs um, uh, automatically, but you cannot actually always change them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this uh, this branch because I want my input to be uh, right before the score module. Uh, 
yeah, so it's gone. So I wasn't supposed to delete that, but so if you search for web service, um, I need the input one. So I'm going to bring that in and I'm going to keep it connected to here so that I don't have to provide the charges and, you know, X observations, the project, the columns that I left out, right? So, so this was generated automatically for you, but like I said, once you get the idea, you can do it by yourself. Can you make it a little bit bigger? I will do that now. run it, give it a one more run before I persist it as a web service, okay? So once it's finished running, I can deploy a web service by deploying the web service button. And uh, now I have a web service that I can go ahead and test, okay? For that, I'm going to go to Excel. Of my Excel, um, and I'm going to create a blank web for, a workbook. And uh, in the Insert tab, you will see the store icon. Click on that. So just open up your Excel, go to the Insert tab, and in the store, you will search for the machine learning app. Add it actually. And Azure Machine Learning should be the first to come up. Okay. Now I'm installing an add-in to my Excel so that I can call that web service. So uh, once you click on it and you trust it, it will uh, have this little uh, panel on the on the side for you to add your web service. Okay. So let's do that. Let's add our, it already has some web services that are attached, uh, added already that you can play with. But I want to show you how you add yours. So click on add web, web service. There are two things that you need to provide here. The URL of the web, web, web service and the API key. And those we get from our um, Azure ML uh, web service page. Remember, uh, once we published our web service, it took us to this uh, page here. So um, the uh, API key is easy, it's right here. Just copy it with a copy button and then go back to your Excel and paste it. And then we need uh, the, uh, the URI, which is here. Copy that. I just clicked on the request response API help page here, and that took me to that web page. And I copied that. And in that uh, web page, actually, there is a lot of information on how the co there are code snippets that you can use to call your web service from C sharp applications, you know, R, Python, etc. So uh, that's also available. Excel is just an outlet here for that matter. So I pasted my URL. That's all I needed. I'm just going to add this as a web service. It's going to do something. And now I have my web service actually set up. Now let's do a prediction. Uh, it has this nice feature of using sample data. Once I click on this, it's going to uh, throw in a, a sample data. Uh, unfortunately, these are blank. Uh, so I will add, for example, let's do New Jersey. Uh, international plan, yes. Voicemail plan, yes, right? And uh, let's do these hundreds. All the minutes I'm going to call hundreds. So this guy was making one call <laughs> and talking for 100 minutes, right? And made just, uh, let's say, three customer calls. Now, uh, I'm going to select that range as my uh, as my data. So once you select that range and uh, hit the select range, it should pick it up. Hit OK here, and I need an output uh, cell, so I will do A4, 
A4. And once I click predict, this is where it's making a call to the web service that I just published. And voila, we have our results. So I'm, the, the original uh, columns came back, apparently. And, but I also have these uh, support labels and support probabilities columns. So these, this guy was uh, predicted to be uh, triggered by 0.99999%. Okay? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so, uh, so now let's, uh, let's move on uh, to other cool stuff, right? Uh, what I want you to do now is go back to the experiment. Here. What is the um, tab for the Excel for Apple? For the Mac? It should be the same thing. Yeah, let's talk chat after the session that we may uh, help you find that. Um, so now remember we have the R and you know Python accessibility that needs to uh, be shown here. So I'm going back to my experiments. I'm gonna uh, uh, pick the churn experiment. The predictive experiment was automatically created for us, and that's the one on the top. Uh, don't touch that. That's that's tied to the web service. So if you mess with it, your web service will get broken. Okay, so go back to the original, uh, and uh, you still have the tabular structure, but it's fine. Uh, let's just uh, save this as a new experiment and try to start modifying it. Okay, I'm just going to save this churn, uh, uh, call it uh, decision tree. Okay. So now it's a brand new experiment. It, if you go to your tab, experiments tab, you will see it as a new service. I want you to actually highlight everything here, including the split data and you know score evaluate, etc., and delete that. Those. Um, one thing we need to do here, actually, before we uh, uh, go into a decision tree, like uh, you know, model. Uh, is to add a, a metadata editor. The reason being, you know, some column types are not good for our part, uh, which I will be using. So I need to edit those. So once you put in your metadata editor, the idea is same with the project columns. You launch the column selector and you pick uh, state, uh, international plan, and voicemail plan. This time I'm just selecting those because I'm going to modify those. Okay? And I'm going to make them here uh, categorical. So right now, uh, you know, before going into execute our script, I need to set it up. You can set it in the execute our script as, as well. You can make these as factors before you run anything. That's also possible. Uh, so once you do that, this time let's pull in and execute our script, our script uh, module, and connect that. Now remember, I asked you to download this R script of you know CSV. It's really uh, nothing much in here, uh, and uh, I'm not going to do. I'm not even going to do a split. You know, I'm going to train on the whole damn data set. In, a, in our part, a C tree using the Party library, um, and I want you to just uh, you know sort of copy all the first uh, the first chunk of code on the churn decision tree under uh, uh, up until the scatter plus. Copy that and paste it in your execute our script, which is here actually. So I need to, it gives you some explanations here on how you can uh, also uh, bring your own zip libraries as, as well. So if, if it's not installed in, uh, in Azure ML, you can zip your library and you know, uh, provide it to execute our script and also use it uh, as well. So once you copy paste, uh, you can look up the details of the script, but it's called like the C tree from, uh, like again, the Part of the library party, and you can just run it. Hopefully, it's going to run, and you know, I'm pushing some columns, the prediction <coughs> columns, to the outputs of that execute our script, and you know, that script has uh, that information in it as well. And I'm also uh, plotting it on the on, on this 
our device port. And once it runs, we will right click and see the decision tree plot. So it is possible to do these plots in Azure ML, inside Azure ML, and then visualize those. Um, Yes. So there are different nodes on the flowchart um, that you have. Is there any difference from where to connect? Of course. Yes. So it's it's a you know as you play around with it, you get the idea. You know, uh, one says it's trained model, the other one says untrained model. So you you know bring those together. But you know, there's so many samples and you know uh, introduction you know material. You'll just get a handle of it right away if you play around with it. You know. Uh, yeah, it makes a difference. And, you know, things will not connect if they're not connectable. So it gives you a warning, you know. So uh, here we are, the script thread. Let's visualize that. And here's our decision tree in the R script, uh, uh, R device port. Okay? And in the other port, uh, I will have actually the results of the predictions, um, score label, and score probability as well, right? So, that was one thing. And then you can do a ggplot as well. Let's do that. That's easy to do. Well, let's skip that for the sake of, uh, you know, you already seen how our device, um, our board can be used to visualize, etc. So what I want to show now is to create an R model and operationalize it, actually, okay? Uh, with the train, uh, with the split, uh, uh, train and test split, etc. Um, so for that, let's save this as a, a new, Experiment and let's call this GLM. Okay. So again, if you go to your experiments, this is going to appear as a new experiment. This time, I'm going to um, pull in uh, and execute execute. Uh, sorry, about that. create. Create R model. Yes. I'm going to pull in a create R model and I'm going to delete these. Uh, this one is not needed either. And I'm going to treat this as, uh, as any of the learners like the Boosted Decision Tree module that came in. But I'm going to replace the trainer and score scripts with R scripts, depending on what library I'm using. Okay? So I need to train. Uh, train I need the train module as well, and I need an evaluate model module, and I need an execute R execute R scripts here to uh, set some features of the output. So again, this is an untrained model goes to the train model, uh, and we need a split. So let's do the split as well. And let's set it to 70%. And we have an execute our uh, score. We need a score, right? So this time I'm just going to score the test uh, test data. So what does score do? It just takes the uh, it uses the train model to make predictions. It's like predict the right? That's pretty much it. Um, so I'm connecting, making all the. Uh, Connections, and I'm gonna pick my target column, the label as churn, like I did. And I need to fill in this uh, trainer and score scripts, and I'm gonna take them from my uh, our script CSV here. So this time I'm gonna do a GLM, very simple GLM uh, logistic regression on the churn churn column, and. I'm gonna take the trainer R script one and paste it into the trainer R script. And then 
I'm also going to take this scorer or uh, R script where I call the predict. This will be used by the score model module actually to score the, uh, the GLM. And uh, let's do that. And one last uh, step here is to, before the evaluate model, I need to set up some attributes of the columns to, for evaluate model to understand and use that data. And I'm doing that too with this execute R script. And I should be good to go. If not, I have a baked one. But I'll show it to you. <laughs> so let's let's do that. Let's run this. So instead of a, a built-in function, I use the create R model, right? And provided the trainer script and the score script. Same flow of files. And I use a trip there with the execute R script to have evaluate R, evaluate a model module understand what data I'm feeding it to it. Okay. So you can all do all sorts of fancy stuff yourself with R and you know, totally uh, publish it as a web service with this method. Um, so uh, once it runs, what we remains to do is actually uh, come back here and you know call it from uh, as a as another web service. But you have already seen that. So um, once this is done, let's check the evaluate uh, model and see, see uh, what our accuracy is and so on. And uh, quickly uh, set it up as a web service. <laughs> so any questions? Yeah. Can you parameterize any of this to pass in? Parameterize? Uh, this entire workflow to pass in different sets of values or finally equivalent? No, unfortunately, you can't. You have to. Yeah, you won't be able to do that, unfortunately. It has a modular structure to make it easy, you know, uh, and approachable for people. But you can yeah, write your for loops in, in your execute R scripts and do all sorts of things in your execute R script. And, uh, it, you know, like I said, the sky is the limit here, but it doesn't have a built-in sort of go through all these models and give it the best. Um, it has a built-in three parameters that I would mention that goes through the parameters of the model, but it won't go through many, many models, like many different algorithm types, and uh, optimize like that. I think that's the question, right? Sort of. Uh, on a more generic side, yeah. the question was if, if, if I were to publish this um, to a community, and they have different, let's assume that the structure is the same, they have different Content, different names, uh, perhaps different selection criteria for models in there. Could some of this be parameterized? I see. Yeah, no, it's a very good idea. Though. I'll take it up to my management. It's a good <laughs> idea. Why not? Yeah, definitely. But yeah, unfortunately, not in a very easy way. Yeah. Question? Yeah, so, uh, can you, you collaborate on this? I mean, I like 10 people working on a single uh, like project. Can you come again? Sorry. Oh, can you, can you like have a team work on the same project? Yes. Like, collaborate or yes, you can. Around? Thank you. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Um, so all these workspaces are totally shareable with uh, with other users. Okay. So as you can see, first of all, it finished uh, the accuracy, um, you know, precision recall, etc. Are all displayed here. So we already have this. We were able to successfully create our our model using GLM. So coming back to your question, um, everything is uh, shareable. So if you go to the settings, you have a users tab here. And see my coworker, um, she is already invited so she can see this uh, workspace. What she's going to do when she comes up is she's going to use her own laptop, her own browser, and she will have access to the same workspace. She can do whatever with it. You know, she can add experiments, you know, modify, etc. And that's what she's going to do. Very good question. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Is there a way to share this whole workflow with someone else? 
So uh, you can what, publish it to gallery. We have a gallery, oh. and we have a publish to gallery button. Oh. You make it available to the whole world. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Oh, so that is, and that's it. that's a cool feature we are okay. uh, we've been developing because we want this to be a collaborative uh, environment. Yeah. We want all the data scientists all over the world, you know, collaborate with each other. You know, their cool uh, experiments up there. Yeah. When we're trying to republish a project uh, already created. Is it going to create a new API? Why are we trying to change the URL? Or is it going to change the web service URL? Right, so we have a retraining web service thing okay. that you can retrain and publish on top of the same web service. <coughs> so, but every time I do a predictive web service like this, it's going to create a new endpoint, a new call, you know, uh, request response uh, API. But that is available to publish on top of what's available. So, as you can see, I just uh, created the predictive experiment for that R model and, uh, and I'm going to run it again here. So the helper thing, just got rid of the modules that are not needed because all you need is a train model and a scorer actually. And now I'm going to, uh, it's still running, once it runs I'm just going to again with one click publish it as a web service. Okay. And um, with that said, let me publish to gallery, uh, not to gallery, sorry about that. Well, that's, as you can see, you can publish to gallery as well with, uh, if you can pass through all these uh, features here, questions, uh, and I'm going to deploy this as a web service. And you know the rest, you know how you can take it and make it a, in your application. Yes? Are there any performance trade-offs between using R script and Python script versus using pre-built modules or machine modules? Uh, yes, I mean pre-built modules are pretty fast and strong and they're optimized, etc. Uh, our script, you know, ones are purely running on that virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, they have our studio R, uh, R installed in them and they're just processing them as they would, you know, things would get processed in a local machine. Okay. So there's no performance enhancement to the R, R scripts uh, per se. So it's the same thing, almost like running it on your local. Okay. So, yeah. So as you can see, we have the uh, churn GLM as our web service. And uh, with that, I could conclude my part, and I'm going to have Moshi come up and show you the Python accessibility, which is also another uh, crazy feature. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Thank you very much.
And uh, so I'm going to demo something about the Python part of this Azure ML Studio. So um, in the first uh, keynote introduction, people talk about the IPython level of integration of uh, Azure ML, uh, including like also Google uh, Google Cloud Lab and also IBM something. So uh, today I'm going to demo you how Azure ML is integrated with IPython notebook. And um, this is like a pretty new feature and a cool feature to me because I'm a pretty much a Python lover. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe a lot of people are on the same line with me, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, this is like we will use the same data set, but we will do a classroom model. So it's um, quite different from uh, the final classification model. So if you drop off in the middle, previously you can pick it up again. So right now what we want to do is to go to the GitHub, uh, GitHub Center and download the lab2 files if you have it. And we will use materials from there. So if you have that ready, and you can see like besides the experiment, web services, data set, trend models, you will have also have this notebook tab. And if you click new, there are uh, Python 3, Python 2. So in this lab, we will create this Python 2 notebook just to not as we will create a Python 2 notebook because the current Azure ML package in Python doesn't really work well with Python 3. So we are working on that. And, uh, uh, this is a little bit uh, trouble here because the feature has been uh, enabled. So I want to I want you to all upload the, the IPython notebook that is in the lab two files folder so you can avoid like a lot of trouble copy pasting. But in order to do that, you first need to create a new one, and you will come to the Jupyter Python notebook, and then you open up. Okay, so you open up this one, you will go to the console. So you click on upload, you will find the. Go up one. No, go into center. Um, Um, okay. Yep. Yep. And you upload it. So it takes like uh, several tens of seconds to upload it. And after you upload it, you can see it in your web server uh, uh, workspace. So that's waited. Okay. So now it's finished. If you go back to workspace and uh, refresh the workspace, you will see it show up here. Okay, now we have this ready. We can open it. This is an IPython notebook I previously developed to the classroom model. So uh, Microsoft has developed this Azure Machine Learning Python client library, and there are some cool features about it. It's about Azure ML and the IPython notebook intuition. What it can do is First, you can access your data that, that, that's already in the workspace using your IPython notebook. So the IPython notebook can be run either on top of Azure ML, as I'm currently doing, or you can run it from your local machine. So uh, there is a function to do that, and uh, I will show you how to do that later. Uh, the second feature is you can also download intermediate data sets that were uh, already created within Azure ML using the experiments. So you have several modules that Fidian just introduced. You can access all of the output data from uh, any module you created by using this library. And also you can upload your new data set and uh, update the existing data set using this library. You can publish your default function as a web service as well. You don't need to go into the studio and click publish the web service. You can deploy your code directly from here. Uh, also, you can consume published web service on Azure, just like what Fidel just did. You then publish a web service, I want to use that from my iPython notebook, I can consume it from here. Okay, so I think you have your iPython notebook ready, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, so let's start. 
let's first start with some initialization work just to import NumPy, MatplotPy, uh, MatplotLib, and Pandas or something, and set up some plot parameters. And then, so for this, this is the first checkpoint. We want to access the customer churn data we just uploaded uh, from, from IPython notebook. So if you go back and uh, you go to any experiment you just created, and you find out this customer churn data. So you right click on the port. You can see create data access code. Click on that, you will have that code directly generated for you. It contains information including a workspace ID and also an authentication token. So this is a very convenient way to create the code, but if you prefer it, you can also find related information from here, like the workspace ID, authenticate, uh, authorization token from here, and uh, copy and paste it into a code. You will reach at the same thing as like here. So here, I will just run this. And then, you will see the data has already been imported into here. So let's see the data a little bit. Print the size of data, and uh, let's look at the data, how the data looks like. So it's the same data as we just used, so you're familiar with it. And uh, then we want to look at the data type of each column and the unique value counts of each column. So you run this little code, and you will see the table, same as I do. Um, so you can see most of them are numeric features, but some of them with an object as a data type are categorical features. So as many of you may know, K-means doesn't deal with categorical features naturally. So because this is not like a data science 200 or 300 level course, so I will skip <laughs> that statistical problem and just delete all the categorical features to like make the workflow smooth. So that comes to the data pre-processing part. So we want to exclude all the columns that is categorical and also we want to exclude all the columns as Fidenta side highly correlated with some others. So finally we will end up using 11 features in this classroom module. Um, then here's the second checkpoint. So we have cleaned the data and we want to push the data back to the workspace so you can also consume it, use it for other experiments. That you want to run this one. So this name here is the, is the data set name you are going to see in your workspace and you can put a description to remind you what it is. So if you run this, oh, oops. I think it's because I think it's because the data is already in there. Okay, so you, if you encounter a problem as I do, just let me know because I have this problem because I have already created that data set. So if you create it twice, it will give you an error. But it should be fine for you. Let me know if you have any question on this side and uh, we can do that. So just remember, if you want to update an existing data set instead of like upload a new one, you use update from data frame instead of add from data frame. And also here is a k-means classroom model. So this is the simplest part, and this is just from secular, you can use it and run it from here. And uh, first let's see our initial classroom results. This is to see how many data points are in each cluster. So we have this, like there are four clusters, and each of them has around like 1,200 1, data points. And we can also create a test data point with 11 features and put it into the trend cluster model and see what cluster it is assigned. So this is to create a test data set and uh, you're going to predict it. So it is assigned as cluster zero. So all clear to now? Okay. So this part is to visualize the classroom result a little bit. This is really about playing with IPython and uh, see the good visualization function of it. So what I did is I created four charts. The four charts will profile 
account lens against each of the following attributes. That's day means, evening means, international means, and night means. So these are only, because this is a high dimensional problem, you cannot visualize it using all of the features. So I selected five of the features and you can visualize it easily. So here are the visualizations. Um, this is account lens against day means, account lens against evening means, and uh, international means and night means. So I think what this four feature, uh, features, uh, figures tells me is, like, account lens is not a very predictive feature. It doesn't distinguish between classes. But this day means, this evening means, and this night means is a very good feature that it distinguishes different clusters. So you can also play around with this neuralization tool and uh, see like whatever insight you want to get out of it. And uh, so it's just a Python cool feature. Okay, with that model developed and tested, now we want to do the same thing as Vivianus did, like publish as a web service so we can consume it from a web app, from a phone app, from a um, whatever you want, want to use, a dashboard or something, or Excel. So this is the third checkpoint. Um, that is to publish a trend model in IPython notebook to Azure Workspace. So it is also very easy. Or you, uh, there are several steps you, you need to do. First, you need to wrap up your, uh, your trend model into a function. I will name this function as customer assign cluster. What it does is it takes in 11 features and then return the, uh, it will return the predict result from the trend cluster model on these 11 features. And uh, with, that, with this function, you, what you need is, you, again, work with, uh, your workspace ID, authorization token, and uh, you want to put this um, data type of the features here. So you run this, and also you return data type. So it will show up as a web service. So let's go back here. Okay, so you can see like, you know, so I, I saw, I created several times, so you can see several, <laughs> so, but basically you can see this web service here. And uh, this, it has the same name as the function name you just created. Okay, so now we already have a, a web service. So in order to use a web service, if you know it, like, the basic information you need is a, a web service name, input, param uh, input parameters, and a data type of input, input parameters, equally output parameters and, da and, and the data types, and also the URL and API key. So all of this you can access from this created service object. So if you print this service project dot service dot URL, it will give you the URL. And uh, also service dot API key, it will give you an API key. And this help URL, if you copy paste this URL into your uh, browser, you will see the same thing. Let's do that. Oops. There's an uh, unquote at the end of the URL. What's that? I think there was a extra quote Go to the end. I think there was a go to the end of the year. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, anyways, what I want to show you is, let me, actually let me redo it. So, what I want to show you is, actually if you do this, you will, you will see the same thing as here. It's a request response. Yeah, it will be the same URL here. And, uh, yep, so, 
In that case, you will have a web service ready in your workspace and you should be able to consume it um, from the web service. And also, the last checkpoint is consumer web service. So again, what you need from the web service is URL, API key, and uh, also the input parameter and the data type, upper, output parameter and the data type. And also, the last thing is, like instead of create a function that has content in it, you actually create a function that is an empty one. And you just put a pass there. What it does is it will take the web service into the content of the function. So if you call the function, you will automatically call the web service you created, send the parameter in, and get the return result back. So if you run it and you input the 11, 11 parameters, and uh, it will send the 11 parameters to the web service, run the web service which is created, and return the result back. Okay. Can you pull that web service from itself? Uh, yes, it's exactly the same web, web service as we then created. It's just a different approach. So you have to use that machine language uh, uh, add anything from the store? Exactly, yes, to yes. yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now we return the result. It's assigned uh, as cluster one. So uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> So one more closing remark. Yeah. Uh, say you're just you don't want to go out of your R Studio, <laughs> all right? You don't want to deal with the UI, etc. You've done everything in R Studio. Uh, you just want to use this nice uh, publish as a web service functionality. Um, you can uh, you can do that easily. Just like Mushi showed, we have the similar thing in R Studio uh, where you wrap your predict function as a around another function and make that as a web service. So I've done that here, uh, and uh, I can write the code as well. So that's also perfectly possible for you to operate to your R and for your Python uh, models, and then just have them uh, published to uh, Azure as web services. Um, so that, with that, we just conclude. And if you have questions, happy to answer. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thanks for coming.